Level zero, the city is alive. Streets pulse with trade and laughter. Temples gleam under the sun. Scrolls are written, monuments carved, calendars etched with centuries to come. They believe it will last forever. Every empire does. From the pharaohs of Egypt to the kings of Mesopotamia, every ruler built as if the stones would never fall, but foundations crack in silence. It begins with small things, a delayed harvest, a missing caravan, a failed omen, priests tighten rituals, scribes rewrite signs, the people whisper, but the pageantry goes on. Collapse doesn't announce itself, it waits, in the libraries, in the courts, in the soil, until one day, the market is empty, the temples close, and the wind howls through empty streets where gods once walked. Every civilization leaves signs before collapse, ignored warnings written in architecture, law, and silence. Level 1. The skies shift. The rains don't come. Crops wither beneath a sun that no longer listens. Wells dry. Rivers shrink. And the people wait. For gods. For clouds for mercy, but the drought doesn't end. This is how it began for the Maya, a civilization of astronomers and architects. They charted stars, they built step pyramids aligned with equinoxes. Then, long drought, repeated, prolonged. They cut down more forest for farmland, worsening their own fate. City by city, they left. Not in flames, but in silence. The jungle swallowed their monuments, their glyphs stopped mid-sentence, and the cities that once held tens of thousands stood alone, crumbling under a sky that refused to rain. Environmental collapse is quiet. It doesn't scream or march or burn. It just stops sustaining. And so everything else stops. Climate change isn't modern. Ancient civilizations also fell because nature stopped cooperating and they weren't ready. Level 2. Growth felt like victory. More people meant more workers, more warriors, more worship, more statues, more prestige, until there were too many mouths, too few trees, too little land. On Easter Island, the Rapa Nui believed their gods walked the earth, if only they could build the bodies. So they carved Moai, towering heads with blank expressions, and dragged them across miles of land using trees as rollers. The forest was their scaffolding, their tool, their resource, and they used it all. Tree by tree, the island was stripped bare. At first, no one noticed. The winds picked up, the rains slowed, crops began to fail. Still, the statues came, but then came hunger. No trees meant no canoes. No canoes meant no deep-sea fishing. The islanders turned on each other, tribes split, clans fought, statues were toppled, not by age but by rage. The spiritual monuments became the battlegrounds of a starving people, and when the soil gave out, so did the people. Famine, war, collapse. The Moai still stand, silent and heavy, watching over an island that once buzzed with life. But their creators are long gone, claimed by the land they overused and the gods they tried to please with stone. Level 3. The gates were strong, the walls were thick, the soldiers trained. But strength doesn't always matter, not when your enemy brings something you've never seen. Not when the war begins before the first arrow flies. When Hernan Cortes stepped onto the shores of the Aztec Empire, he brought fewer than a thousand men, but he also brought smallpox, an invisible weapon. It spread like fire through a dry forest, killing leaders, warriors, priests. The emperor himself fell ill. Within weeks, the mighty Aztecs weren't just facing an enemy, they were burying their own future. But disease was only the beginning. Cortes turned local resentment into leverage. He promised revenge, protection, trade. Rival tribes that had long suffered under Aztec tribute gladly joined the Spanish cause. The invaders weren't just foreign, they were strategic. Tenochtitlan, the jewel of the empire, sat atop a lake, grand temples rising above mirror-like canals. It looked invincible, but water couldn't protect them from treachery. The siege came slowly, sickness came faster, food ran out, allies disappeared, and when the final assault came, the empire had already rotted from within. The Aztecs fell not because they were weak, but because they were confident. Too confident to imagine that an empire could die from a handshake. Too confident to see betrayal coming cloaked in diplomacy. Level 4. There's no warning bell, no drumbeat of war. Just a cough, a fever, a body in the square, and then ten, then a hundred. Then they stop counting. The plague of Justinian swept through Constantinople in 541 AD, killing up to 40% of the population, nearly 100 million globally in its waves. It didn't come with a sword, but with fleas, riding rats, hiding in grain ships, 
waiting in shadow. At first, they tried to bury the bodies, then they stacked them, then they burned them. The city of emperors, of golden domes and endless trade, became a mass grave. Mothers buried children, priests fell silent. Even the emperor, Justinian I, barely survived. Three centuries later, the Black Death would return, with a vengeance. It arrived on boats, on traders, on breath. It didn't matter if you were a peasant or a prince. If you inhaled the wrong breeze, your days were numbered. Entire villages vanished. In some towns, there were too few left to dig the graves. Fields grew wild. Cattle wandered untended. Churches locked their doors and boarded up their altars. People begged heaven for mercy. But heaven didn't answer, and yet not everything died. Feudal lords lost their grip. Labor became rare and valuable. The plague, in all its horror, gave birth to a new kind of world, a Europe with wages, with mobility, with rebellion simmering under the surface. Because a pandemic doesn't just kill the body, it kills routine, it kills hierarchy, it kills the illusion that anything is permanent. It doesn't ask for permission, it doesn't care about kings. It's not an enemy you can stab. Level 5. The empire still stands. The roads are clear, the aqueducts hum, the taxes flow. On the surface, all is well, but beneath the marble, rot. The Senate is bloated, the generals are ambitious, and the citizens, they no longer believe. They believe in their gods, their families, their coin, but not in Rome, not anymore. This was the empire not at war, but at dinner, feasting while the edges crumbled, debating while enemies massed, worshipping tradition while ignoring decay. They fought wars not for survival, but for pride. They appointed emperors, not by merit, but by favor, often chosen by bribes or blood. In just one 50-year span, 26 emperors rose and fell, many assassinated by their own guards. Corruption didn't come as a sword. It came as comfort, as luxury, as distraction. They stopped fixing what mattered. Let the roads crack. Let the armies shrink. Let the law bend. They passed power from weak hands to weaker ones until there was no one left strong enough to hold it. So when the Goths, the Huns, the Vandals came, Rome wasn't conquered. It was collected, like a fruit too ripe to stay on the branch. It fell, not in a blaze of glory, but in a tired sigh. You don't need fire to fall. Sometimes you just need enough people to stop caring. Moral decay can be more fatal than war. When leadership fails, collapse becomes self-inflicted. Level 6. Once their coins were gold, stamped with emperors, backed by armies, trusted by the world, then bronze, then copper, then worthless. Merchants stopped accepting imperial currency. Wages stagnated. Soldiers went unpaid. This was the late Roman Empire, where inflation wasn't just a number, it was a symptom of collapsing trade, of dwindling silver mines, of emperors desperate to maintain an illusion of control. So they debased the currency, shaved the coins, mixed in cheaper metals, and told the people nothing had changed. But it had. People stopped trusting money, barter returned, black markets thrived, and Rome's vast economic web began to unravel, thread by thread. And it wouldn't be the last time. Centuries later, in 1929, the Great Depression swept through the modern world. Banks folded, stocks disintegrated, Factories closed and millions lined up, not for luxuries, but for food. Families lost homes. Children grew up in tents. Men once suited and salaried now begged for bread. It wasn't just financial. It was emotional, a rupture in the shared belief that society would always provide. Because that's what money is, not paper, not metal, but faith. When belief in a system collapses, the system follows. And unlike buildings, belief isn't easily rebuilt. Economies are fragile ecosystems. Collapse often comes not from scarcity, but from mistrust. Level 7. For centuries, temples reached toward the sky, carved from stone, painted in color, built to echo with chants and incense. Priests ruled through ritual. Gods sat in gold and obsidian. The people offered grain, blood, jewels, whatever it took to keep the heavens satisfied. Religion wasn't part of life. It was the architecture of reality. And then they vanished, not the gods the belief in them. In ancient Egypt, pharaohs were more than rulers. They were divine. The Nile flooded on command. The sun rose for them. Statues wore their crowns. But as the Roman Empire spread, another faith crept in. Not with war, but with whispers. Christianity. What began in underground gatherings soon stood above the skyline. Crosses replaced anks. Temples became churches. What couldn't be repurposed was erased. Priests of old were labeled heretics. Scrolls were burned. 
Statues were defaced, noses smashed, faces chiseled, eyes gouged out, and it didn't stop in Egypt. In the Americas, Spanish missionaries crossed oceans with two weapons, the sword and the Bible. They tore down pyramids to build cathedrals, masked saints as local gods, and called it salvation. In a single generation, entire pantheons were erased, entire worldviews reprogrammed. When gods fall, so do the calendars, rituals, laws, and language built around them. The collapse isn't visible until it's complete, and by then, the stories are already forgotten. When belief systems collapse, the structures around them fall next, not in war, but in worship. Shifts in faith can end empires. When belief systems collapse, so does the society built around them. Level 8. They built roads that stretched for miles, straight as arrows, paved in stone, aqueducts that carried water through valleys and over mountains, domes that pierced the heavens, defying gravity with grace. And then, they forgot. When Rome fell, it didn't take its engineering with it. It left it behind, but no one remembered how to use it. Concrete, once used to build harbors and temples that still stand today, became a lost formula. People saw the ruins, but not the recipe. They marveled at the domes, but couldn't rebuild them. Surgical tools rusted in abandoned cabinets. Sanitation systems clogged and collapsed. Clean water became a luxury, disease, the new priest. Historians once called it the Dark Ages, not because the world was evil, but because the light of progress flickered low. For centuries, the average person lived a life less advanced than their Roman ancestors. No plumbing, no libraries, no legal structure that extended beyond the nearest warlord. This wasn't collapse by sword or fire, it was collapse by forgetting, by losing the thread, by letting knowledge die with its keepers. Innovation stalled, invention froze, Curiosity became superstition. Only centuries later, during the Renaissance, would Europe begin to rediscover what it once knew. They studied old scrolls as if they were revelations, not realizing those discoveries were just echoes of the past. Civilizations don't just fall backwards, they pause, they freeze, and they forget how to move forward. Level 9. It was a normal day. Children played. Merchants haggled. The sky was clear, except for the plume rising behind the mountain. Pompeii, 79 AD. The city bustled beneath Mount Vesuvius, its people unaware they were living on borrowed time. They had seen smoke before. They had heard the mountain rumble, but nothing had ever come of it. So they stayed, and then the sky turned black. Not nightfall, something worse. Ash, thick, choking, endless. The ground shook, buildings cracked, roof tiles clattered into the streets as people screamed and fled. But it was already too late. The eruption unleashed a pyroclastic surge, a wall of gas, ash, and molten rock, rushing at over 100 kilometers per hour. It wasn't just fire, it was a furnace on legs, a pressure wave that vaporized what it touched. People died mid-meal, mid-embrace, mid-prayer. Some were suffocated in seconds, others boiled alive, their final poses frozen in twisted agony beneath meters of volcanic debris. Flesh turned to charcoal, bones to dust. The city was buried so fast that loaves of bread were found still in the oven, carbonized but whole. And then, silence. For over 1,700 years, Pompeii was lost, its name remembered but not its streets, until excavation revealed a city frozen in time, a tragedy immortalized in ash. This wasn't war, it wasn't conquest or famine, it was the earth itself, unpredictable, merciless, absolute, a reminder that for all our gods and walls and glory. We live at the mercy of the ground beneath our feet. Nature has no warning label. Civilizations near fault lines, volcanoes, and flood zones live on borrowed time. Level 10. It starts with whispers, then shouts, then fire. Palaces burn, statues fall, banners are ripped from their poles. The king is gone, or worse, hiding. This is rebellion, and it doesn't ask politely. In 1789, the French people had had enough. They were starving while the monarchy dined on silver plates. The economy was broken, the taxes unfair, the laws absurd, so they marched, and the guillotine followed. Revolutions feel righteous, until the power vacuum appears, then it's chaos. Power changes hands not once, but a dozen times. Today's heroes become tomorrow's traitors. Justice turns into revenge. In China, the Qin Dynasty unified an empire with iron discipline, then collapsed within 15 years under the weight of rebellion. The people rose the empire fell. A civilization doesn't always need an outsider to end it. Sometimes the enemy lives inside the walls. Revolutions are collapses born from within. When people stop fearing the system, 
they destroy it. Level 11. There are no battle scars here. No ruins scorched black, no bones in the soil, just silence. The Indus Valley civilization once stretched across modern-day Pakistan and India. It had organized streets, plumbing, granaries, 1,000 years before Rome. They traded, they crafted, they wrote in symbols we still can't read. And then, they were gone. No army, no plague, no explosion, just abandoned cities, slowly reclaimed by dust. Theories abound, climate change, shifting rivers, slow migration. But the truth is, we don't know, and maybe never will. When a civilization disappears without burning, the silence is louder than fire. No conqueror wrote of their victory, no survivor sang of the end. They vanished and left only questions. A people can do everything right, build well, plan wisely, live long, and still be erased. A civilization's survival depends on memory. When stories aren't passed on, cultures fade, sometimes forever. Level 12. Cliff dwellings cling to the rock like ancient memories. Stairways carved into stone, pots left behind mid-meal, and yet not a soul in sight. The ancestral Puebloans, builders of Mesa Verde and Chaco Canyon, thrived for centuries. They mastered desert farming, astronomy, architecture, and then they left. Not in a rush, not by sword, but over years, maybe decades. The reason, still debated, prolonged drought, internal strife, resource pressure. Whatever it was, it was enough to make them walk away from everything they had built. They didn't collapse in chaos. They dissolved, slowly, quietly, and now their homes remain, haunted by wind, silence, and the echo of vanished voices. Isolation protected them for centuries, until it didn't. Geography protects until it imprisons. Isolation can preserve or erase. Level 13. The kingdoms were strong, the palaces full, the cities humming with trade. Then, in the space of a single lifetime, gone. Between 1200 and 1150 BCE, entire civilizations across the eastern Mediterranean collapsed like dominoes. The Mycenaeans, the Hittites, Ugarit, empires that had stood for centuries crumbled into ash. No one cause, no one enemy. It was the system itself, too large, too interconnected, too delicate. Trade routes failed. One city's famine became another's war. Supply lines collapsed. Migration surged. Invaders, maybe the mysterious Sea Peoples, attacked what was already weak. This was the Bronze Age collapse, a civilizational chain reaction. When the network broke, the whole thing fell apart, collapsed by complexity, not because they were backward, but because they were advanced, too advanced to survive disruption. And when they fell, they took writing, engineering, and diplomacy with them, setting human progress back centuries. Complexity is strength until it becomes a weakness. The more systems depend on each other, the more fragile they become. Level 14. You walk through jungle. The air is thick. The trees tower. And suddenly, stone, walls, faces, columns, cities, a civilization lost, not by war or disaster, but by time. Great Zimbabwe, once a thriving trade hub in Africa, was so sophisticated that early European explorers refused to believe locals had built it. They were wrong. The Olmecs, the Nabataean city of Petra, the civilizations of the Sahel, many didn't fall. They were forgotten, their names erased from textbooks, their histories scattered, sometimes intentionally, sometimes by accident, sometimes because no one left behind a voice loud enough to last. Centuries later, archaeologists stumble across walls buried in sand, roads hidden beneath rainforest, a temple's shadow caught by satellite. Not ruins of destruction, just ruins of neglect. Civilizations buried alive, under jungle, myth, or denial. And even now, we've only scratched the surface. There are hundreds, maybe thousands, of lost civilizations we haven't even discovered yet. You can't mourn what you never knew existed, but it doesn't mean they weren't great. History is incomplete. For every Rome and Babylon we remember, there are 10 more we haven't found yet. If you love stories that history tried to bury, subscribe now. We uncover the past one lost world at a time. See you in the next of the Sasta.